troopers, the police and, and all of the forces of law and order and those that dislike dislike sectarianism sufficiently to think that it's uh, useful to prosecute folk for singing a song. So so I, I must say I'm torn in two different ways. In practice, it's maybe been less appalling in, in courts than, than I thought. But but on the ground, it seems um, it seems rather worrying what's transpiring to me. Mm. It's interesting. I mean, I, I often saw this in, in line with a kind of style of Scottish governance that was that was going along with the anti-smoking ban, you know, as in. I remember Jim Sellers once sort of making this classic statement, you don't just take Scotland's sides, you take sides in Scotland, you know. And I always thought that this that there's a kind of behaviour modification ambition that most governments have, which is to say, you know, how do we... Uh, and it comes in with climate legislation as well, so it's like, how do you get people to kind of do what they're supposed to do when it comes to climate? How do you get them to do... Uh, do what they're supposed to do uh, when it comes to any other kind of behaviours or smoking. Often governments say that they have to take a behavioural lead and often an element of punition. You know, you get fined if you don't sort out your rubbish properly. You know, you will get, you'll be chucked out onto the street if you don't, you know, if, you take your, if you take your cigarettes indoors. And I thought there was always an element of this too. Uh, or this was part of that same logic is that how do we, how do we set a cue for public behaviour, particularly of angry, psychotherapised by football West of Scotland men, um, and ask, and actually give them a different script for their behaviour, give them, give them different expectations about how they should conduct themselves in the public realm. Um, if you've been in a, 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 an orange, a clockwork orange train in the Glasgow Underground when the bouncy bouncy uh, carriage uh, perpetration has been going on, uh, you, you won't have a generally friendly attitude towards uh, sectarian energies as expressed by, you know, antic men under the influence of tonic wine. But I think um, you get the same, you, I get the same feelings when, you, when you're when you in a pub and there's a rugby club playing drinking games. For sure. No, of course. So, I, but, but that's what I'm saying. I mean, I'm, I'm ambivalent about it because I can see, we can you can see with, with you know, climate change legislation or you can see with the smoking ban is that there is a there is a role for government to take, which is to say, okay, everybody's you know everybody's bustling around, not quite getting their ethics lined up with their behaviour, or not quite not quite acting on their consciousnesses. This is not dictatorial, but it is to say, do we shall we collectively agree for a while that this is not this is not correct behaviour, and then the queue eventually you know feeds down and and changes stuff. I mean, I just have a problem with. A kind of Chomskyan problem, you know, with the role of football in Scottish life as a great sort of psychic hoover for lots of energies that should probably be deployed elsewhere. I mean, I think there's a great there's a great post-industrial therapy moment going on with with men and football, <laughs> and you know, the, the boss is a gaffer, and you know, I put a good shift in today. I mean, it's almost as if there's a kind of you know pseudo proletarian. A compensation exercise going on for for a lot of guys who are watching football, even if they're not actually necessarily from the working class. Displaced so political I, anger. I, I displaced everything. Displaced male potency. Displaced sense of you know having a kind of straightforward physical agency in the world that, that you that one's fathers or forefathers got from being part of the industrial age. I don't know, but it's just too much. And I mean, add to that the fact that we have the virtual angst of being you know a, a Protestant supremacy in Scotland or a, or a Catholic immigrant presence in Scotland, um, that's, which is now I think. Um, I mean, if this legislation pushes that kind of tension down to the level of the water cooler, you know, rather than um, street level raids between different parts of party bars, you know, um, it, it might have an effect. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm obviously sensitive about it in terms of uh, free speech and so forth. I, I, I do sort of feel as if it, the, the offensive speech should have been prosecutable under existing laws. I think this was just an overreaction, but I, I, can, I can see it in a continuity of, of Scottish attempts, Scottish politicians' attempts to say, you know what, we're pretty tough on ourselves and we're pretty hard on ourselves and we have some deep-seated pathologies um, and what shall we do to address them? I mean, I think diet obesity is probably the next thing, certainly in terms of the cost on a, on a future Scottish national welfare state that is, is the next thorny problem for them to deal with. How in God's name can we get Scots to eat and behave more healthily, so that they help themselves, but also so that, that we don't, you know, just completely blow our, our health budgets in the future. So I think okay, it's part yeah. of an interesting continuity, you know. With the continuity, like this is something I'd like to bring Andrew in on as well. Part of the possible idea of it, like if you're looking at it more cynically, is that 
people felt that the Scottish government had to bring this in because it, under the existing laws, only Rangers fans were basically being prosecuted, or at least much more than Celtic fans. And they wanted to create a kind of more catch-all law that would allow them to even it up, if you if you like. And there was an SNP person who said something actually to that effect, so that they weren't seen as being biased to one side or the other with the, with the existing law. But then, mm. since this law, there's been a lot of accusations that the law is being applied very, very selectively against some supporters more than others. Typically, the law is being used against Celtic fans. And you'll find that a lot of people oh. in this who are Celtic supporters who may be more sympathetic to uh, independence than Rangers supporters, <laughs> shall we say, are being selectively harassed by this law. Also, there's been another accusation, and I just want to see what Andrew thinks about this, that um, it's in some ways uh, it's easy meat for the police to meet their arrest quotas and therefore keep their budgets up. I don't know what you would make of that, mm. Andrew. <laughs> I, I think that, to draw slightly on what Pat was saying, that there's an element of fantasy about this and an element of fantasy about most of prosecutions in this country. Um, the fact is, is that at the moment, uh, among huge crowds full of folk, a large selection of which are singing, you get one or two people arrested. Um, and, and in order for it to be a sort of for me, a convincing uh, argument about stamping things out, then you'd have to you'd have to do it properly. You'd have to arrest loads of people. You'd have to cram the courts. You'd have to you'd have to really enforce this law to the letter. You wouldn't envisage 165 new cases a year if you were going to have a zero tolerance policy. That just doesn't make sense. And I'm very glad that they don't. It must be said, uh, for, because I don't think that would be tolerable. I don't think that would be acceptable for the police to do that. And it'd probably be quite dangerous for the police to do that. In, in court grounds. But but so I, I think there's a degree to which this idea that we are sending a message requires us to believe that we send a message by jailing for short periods of time small numbers of young men while leaving most of the other people singing. And I find that a bit implausible, it must be said. But that's how criminal justice works. Criminal justice is selective. I mean, we don't have equality before the law and up to a point uh, this just simply reflects that more general proposition, but it does so in a particularly ridiculous way because there are these cases which have gone to court where you had lip readers who who were looking at footage of an individual singing and they couldn't for the life of them work out <laughs> what, what, what they were. What well, they was, were. was that the Court Bridge bus? That may have been the Court Bridge bus, actually. It could have been, it could have been. I mean, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not. I don't particularly sympathise with with the. I don't sympathise with sectarian singing. I don't sympathise whatever with you know going home with the on the train in the middle of Glasgow after an old firm match. I don't. I tend to avoid that wherever possible, um, and that probably is a bad thing for some of the reasons that Pat was saying. But I think that fundamentally there's there's a kind of essential dishonesty about this kind of tough on crime stuff which is articulated because it they just if you really want to be tough on crime you're going to resource being tough on crime. And the Crown Office isn't well resourced. The Crown Office and courts are in a pretty woeful, overstretched way, like many of these institutions in our society in this time of austerity. So that doesn't quite answer your question, perhaps, Michael. But it, uh... OK, <laughs> controversial ground, I understand. OK, um, so we're running out of time. So we'll come to our last story, which was um, an interesting thing about the poll this week. Um, that was covered in a few different websites where um, Better Together had sent a poll out, an, an online poll to business leaders or businessmen or business owners around the country where you simply weren't allowed to say that you didn't have a problem with independence. Um, there were, there were se several options given. Uh, what worries you about the possibility of independence? And you could not continue with the poll unless you select, selected at least one of them and then that, <laughs> then then that's kind of reported you know or it could be reported that's a conditional uh <laughs> could, could be reported as you know well 80 percent of business leaders have a problem with such and such i mean what do you make of this kind of um, polling and campaigning for me it's not that much of a surprise it's quite interesting i'm actually looking up the scotchman website at the moment there was a headline which was something this morning like an uh, independent scotland "Quote unquote will face limits." Yeah, that's it. Here we are. Independent Scotland to quote face limits. Is that is that a metaphysical question? Or, <laughs> or is this, you know, is it, is it the fact that women independent will look around and the world will be a bit complicated? And and there and there she is, uh, the shadowy Nicola Sturgeon, sitting there and with shadows glooming her. Uh, imagining all the limits that an independent Scotland will face. I do think there is, there is as, a, as an aspect of media studies, there is something to be carefully annotated and collated 
about the relationship between a Scotsman headline and a Scotsman article. It is quite extraordinary. Do you remember that incident a wee while ago where, actually coming back to the Kareen Polwart uh, article, where she, the article was something like, why I'm voting yes despite the SNP. Um, there was no mention of the SNP whatsoever in the article. There was a flurry of about, of about 40 tweets afterwards of her absolutely denying that she'd even implied that. And then eventually you get a change down the line. I mean, there's, there, I'm not, I don't want to come across as, as the paranoid Pat Nat, you know, but compared to even say something like the op-ed agenda of the, of the Scotsman and the news agenda of the Scotsman and the way that these headlines are and the way that any, it's almost like the eye of Sauron is scanning anything for any kind of headline that can impinge on someone's passing commuter brain as they read the headlines of the newspaper newspaper in order to build up a negative profile and independence i mean i think it's i think someone's really at it in there i really do Uh, (laughs) no um i think all media organizations generally have an agenda Mm. of one sort or another I think there is a difference between the news line of the Scotsman. I write for the Scotsman. In fact, I'm presenting, a, I'm doing a, a conference for the, with the Scotsman on media. So, I mean, we're all, we're all part of the same process. But I think there's a difference between the op-ed and the news pages. I think it's quite extreme. Mm. I think it's quite particular. Anyway. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of these kind of interesting things. This, uh, it recalls something which was happening the other day. I don't know if any of you saw, but uh, Professor Adam... Tompkins from Glasgow University is a very mm. committed unionist guy, he's a bright guy uh, and, and, and goes out to bat for his convictions and, and all power to him for that. And one of the responses to this was quite similar to, to something that happened to me when I got entangled with Ian Davidson is this idea that, you know, we have to be independent and impartial and anything else is kind of scandalous. And personally I mean, I'm very much in favour of the press being as partial as they like and you see throughout lots of different media organisations that they do, you know, in terms of headlines, uh, framing of issues in particular ways through news columns that actually it's a very powerful force and and a sensible person is alive to the extent to which you're being maybe even unconsciously manipulated by the frame which happens to be employed by a journalist um so i don't i don't i don't see that's particularly a bad thing but i do see i do think that you know people have to if you're going to write headlines like that if you're going to pursue a kind of storytelling uh, form of coverage which does these kinds of things you have to be prepared for people to call you out on it and say that but, well but but it particularly annoys me because if you look at the, the sociological uh, correlates of of voting intention in Scotland in terms of class you know, the middle class are rubbish. They're absolutely, they really are. There's no way you can rely on them for anything. Um, and it's, but it's not as if they're not persuadable. Um, we, we don't have any bourgeois media in Scotland that is in any way, other than in small, tiny sections of it, uh, remotely interested in, you know, mobilising the bourgeoisie towards any kind of independence position. And for the people further down the social scale who, who their problem is uh, that they are for independence, but they're so disengaged from the political process that, 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 they, that they can't get involved, uh, they don't want to get involved. And their, their media is just, you know, absolutely, absolutely useless at serving them in any, in any way as citizens. So I think, speaking as a committed yes campaigner, I, I do think it's, I, I didn't realise until we started this how much of an uphill battle it is to get through to the popular consciousness, through the organs of media that we have at the moment. I mean, this is why I'm really happy to be doing a podcast like this, because at least it, it beams out to a select few who are then motivated to go and talk to the five or ten people who who need to be convinced. But I mean, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but I have been amazed at how much of a dead loss the mainstream media has been for the independence cause. I think it's I think it's a, a, a particularly in terms of the middle class. I think it's it's absolutely freezing them into immobility, if not outright scepticism. And I think that's, that's that's a shame. And I can't believe that was even not a commercial opportunity for one of these enterprises to kind of go uh, and explore, to try and actually go for go for the, uh, the, the yes constituency as a as a bourgeois aspiration um, and make that a part of the newspaper marketing campaign. I'm amazed that no one's done it. Maybe, maybe yes, Scotland needs a, a new bourgeoisie for independence group. <laughs> well, if we ain't, if this, if this discussion ain't the bourgeoisie for independence group, I don't know what is, Andrew, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> okay, well, I think I think that's probably time to wrap up for this week. Uh, sorry, a- Andrew, just I, I had to butt out for a minute there. Entangled with Ian Davidson, you said. That was a hideous image. Yeah, thanks for that. No Photoshopping, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, no. 
Um, 